All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about artistry because I think hair can be artistic, and that's what makes it fun for me. Technical, being uh, a technically precise surgeon, and also safety, which comes from understanding, having some experience and, and having good judgment. The problem with hair is that it's a problem, it's not a static problem. It's something you have to think about in the future. Because as you get older, your demand increases and your supply, your donor supply diminishes. So it's an ever losing battle and you have to have a predictive capacity to say down the road you're not going to create something artificial for a patient that you would not be happy to, to have. And that's what the dilemma is, the younger patient in particular, the younger male patient with male pattern baldness. The, we have to understand this Norwood pattern. And if you don't understand it, go start looking at people's balding patterns. Because if you don't see it, you're going to create hairlines that don't make sense. And I was sitting next to a colleague of mine, a facial plastic surgeon, a very esteemed gentleman in San Diego in January of this year. And he goes, Sam, I can always spot a fake one. I said, the gentleman in front of you has a, a toupee, and the one next to you on the right has a, has a transplant of his crown. He said, there's no way. They look so natural to me. I said, that's because you don't do hair. It looks horrible to me. Because that's the same comment we've heard about rhinoplasty. If you don't do rhinoplasty, you probably someone would walk around with these jacked up side, you know, uh, notched up ala, and you're going to not even see it if you don't do noses. That's the same thing with hair. So you'll, you'll, you'll have a guided understanding as you mature with your experience with hair. So we start with the hairline, because the hairline is the first, the, the, the foundation for beautiful work. And the hairline, we talk about the rule of thirds. I think that is a bit arbitrary, I, because there's going to be difference, differences of that. I like the idea that the hairline starts at the intersection between the vertical plane and the horizontal plane at a 45 degree angle. That's the lowest acceptable point, and it's also the point which allows you to frame the face. So if you're a facial plastic surgeon or a plastic surgeon that works on the face, then you are going to be enamored to make a face look more attractive. And the reason to do hair is not to stick hair up on the top of the head, is to make the face look better by framing it. In fact, one thing I love is when I do beautiful hair work, I don't get comments, oh, the hair looks great. People start saying, God, you look so much better. That's because the face looks better. It frames the face. And that component of framing the face is actually extends all the way to the temporal bearing tissues. When you go to the lateral canthus, any hair that's lateral to it that you comb to the center looks like a comb over because that hair should not reside in the center. So your end of your hairline is at the lateral canthus. And then small ideas of transitions we won't get into, but this is just the, the general concept of designing a line. When I run my course in St. Louis, the one thing I notice is that people stay too much in the front of the patient. They don't go to the sides and look. And the, the side is so critical because it should slope upwards or be more aggressive, flat, but never slope down. So look at it from all angles. One of the biggest angles to look at it is actually from a mirror because I will sit there and draw a very quick hairline. I'll take a step back and put the mirror up and, and I stand behind the patient and look at the mirror. And I think, I haven't published this idea, but the concept behind this is that I think that the scalp topography is different. So when you flatten it, it gives you two ideas. It gives you a very immediate feedback how straight that line is because it puts it into a two-dimensional world. It also knocks out all those scalp asymmetries so you get a very clean view. And it's so important to have a straight, a relatively straight line on a mirror view because that's how the patient is photographed and how they see themselves. And it's also important to have a, a relatively straight view from a three-dimensional world because that's how you see the patient. So the other idea is understanding the temple, the hairline is not just the front, it's the temple as well. Because if you just draw this hairline way up here and you don't build up the temples in that light gray zone, it's going to look fake. And that's some reasons why toupees don't look natural, even the most natural ones today. And how can I spot it out? And the reason is that the temple recessions are so significant that the temp, the, even though it's a woven, gorgeous uh, hair system, it doesn't match a natural hair pattern. But I always advise in St. Louis in my courses, don't start doing temple transplants because they're very difficult and it's so easy to make an unnatural result. I advocate not doing it for at least five years, if not three years, into your practice. The patterns of, of recession, if you look at the green over here, this is more of a, of a, not aggressive, but sort of standard frontal temple recession. And this is for a gentleman that's very donor depleted and you can see that the temple loss matches the anterior hairline. Uh, loss and so that pattern has got to make sense, a Norwood pattern. 
you heard Janice talk about PRP. I, I love PRP. It is actually the best single thing I've done for my hair transplant practice in the last decade. It has made my hair growth so much better, more consistent, uh, faster growth. When I'm seeing significant growth at four months instead of six months, I'm seeing better clinical results. I'm not seeing less recovery time. And the way that I'm, I'm doing this, by the way, is I'm taking a Tologel brand PRP and that the theory behind Otologel is that it has about a 1 to 1.5 times physiologic platelet level because platelets carry the growth factors but if you have very very high uh, platelets in some studies they've shown that it actually can degrade the, the growth factors and you want no erythrocytes or leukocytes in there because that can be pro-inflammatory and degrade it. I mix that with A-cell which is short for a porcine uh, bladder um, basement membrane and that actually acts as a scaffold some doctors out there only do PRP, some only do A-cell, and some mix the two. I've just gotten such great results so far that I, I love mixing both of them. And uh, just some really interesting photo here is a gentleman that I did his front, and I just PRP'd his back, and I'm seeing growth. And I had some colleagues of mine actually have noticed this as well, is just PRP in certain areas showing hair growth. So it's phenomenal, not activated by anything, just injected. And it also, what I found is variability when I put the ring block in, sometimes it subsides after a few hours, even with the marcaine. And that uh, superorbital block really sustains the, res uh, the anesthesia for quite some time. Tumescence in the world of hair restoration is critical. I like to think of it like a ship over water. This is the blade, this is your nerve and blood supply, and this is the tumescent solution. So you don't want to be riding it at low tide, because if you don't put tumescence in, you get significant di discomfort. I had a gentleman just come to me, and he had a, went to a very esteemed colleague of mine, had a hair transplant, and his result, he said it was like a nine out of 10 in terms of pain, and when he did mine, he had a two out of 10. And I think it's the reason is I work really hard to protect the nerve and blood supply, and that begins with excellent tumescence. The system that I really have liked to use is the, the coal uh, self-filling instrument. It's not good for facelifts because it's too small. I tried it, it's a 3cc, but it's just, it helps minimize needle sticks and it's such a rapid ability to fill that backside. And I love this instrument. I, I have no financial affiliations with any of these companies I'm, I'm mentioning, by the way. And then just being, taking uh, really good care of harvesting because the, the foundation for a a beautiful clean incision line is not the closure. It begins with a transection free harvest and one in which the nerve and blood supply is uh, saved. I rarely, if ever, have uh, um, any bleeding and I'm so careful to protect all the nerve and blood su supply below. So this is just showing you how you, you make sure you have your angulations correct during the harvest time so you minimize transection. I put in the ring block of the Marcane next and that's gonna give me the uh, block for the rest of the time. Um, and then it, just as a little slide to rem, uh, rem, uh, remind me that uh, Ketorolac or Toradol at the end of the case is wonderful just to cut down any post-operative discomfort. This is the part of the talk I love, which is that was all mechanical. Good mechanics is important, but the artistic component I'm passionate about is the recipient site design because that's where you really can create a work of art where you have a limited amount of paint that you've got to paint the canvas. And the, you, the way you strategize and the way you design it is gonna reflect your work. And so how do you start? You first have to understand all the little areas of the scalp because e the hair in each of those areas grows differently. And so I thought about it, you know, I love teaching and I was thinking about how can I communicate this more clearly to someone just starting out. So I came up with the idea of a box because the scalp is really nothing more than a box. There are vertical planes and horizontal planes and transitional planes. So I like to have people understand that from the front view, remember that 45 degree transition, that's called the hairline. And then on the back side of the head from horizontal to vertical scalp, it's called the vertex transition zone. So the crown is sitting on the vertical uh, posterior scalp. And then remember I told you from the lateral crease, which is the lateral canthus, you get temporal hair or the lateral hump in very de uh, great degrees of recession. And the mid scalp is everything between. And so if you understand the topography of the scalp, you understand how to create shapes and designs and patterns that make sense. And so what does that mean? It means the angle and direction of your sites that you make where this, this hair grafts will go into will make logical sense. So don't worry about the tilt, but the angle is just AP, how you make the site, and the direction is gonna be lateral vis-a-vis a, uh, a, a uh, standard anatomic perspective of the face. So this is just a, a schematic that just shows you different angles. I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. You can see that these are very low. In fact, you can't go too low here and you can't go too high on the crown 
And there's reasons for that. We won't get into too much, but I'll talk a little about this more in a second. And these go super flat. I mean, they're lying flat and they cascade down one row after another. So these are ideas, and if you don't understand this, find someone who has a full head of hair but keeps his hair relatively closely shorn, and you're gonna see that pattern that exists in nature of how it looks on a man, and it's different for a female, which I'll show you in a second. The idea of the central forelock is that if the central forelock is not completely filled in, which is right here, the person looks bald. So you really want to focus on that. And the thing that I've been doing of late in the last couple of years is creating what's called a convergence pattern, which I was taught by a colleague of mine, which is the idea of the scalp slopes like this. You want your recipient sites actually to angle slightly inward to, to, so that they won't fall open, because you really want all the density to be focused right in the center. The extended central forelock is just the concept that goes farther back in. It's because all the light is blocked going back this way. Now, when you're making the recipient sites, you really want to shingle them like a, like, a, uh, a, like a roof. So they all angle like this. They're interlocked, okay, and they're low. So if the patient is in a recumbent supine position, it's much easier for a surgeon to make those angles very low to the, to the scalp. And the reason you want these low is that they create a shadow effect on the, on the bald scalp, which is the whole idea is to cover bald scalp. And also, if you don't see the insertion points of the grafts, you look much more natural. So the front hairline's got to be very low. And when I watch my students at the course do this, the natural tendency is to go too high. And it just it doesn't have density, it looks fake, and it's uncombable. And this is another schematic here showing you that if you place all your, your recipient sites parallel with each other, not interlocked, you have a lot of see-through effect, and you waste a lot of space, and, it's, and you just don't get the density gradient. So how do you make recipient sites? Really a lot of different ways. This is one way I bend needles. This 19 gauge will accommodate typically two hair grafts. 20 uh, gauge will accommodate ones. This will accommodate three hair grafts and four hair grafts. And you can also do um, punches. This is a much more advanced topic. You gotta be very careful of the vascularity. So I wouldn't start with this, but it allows you to take some of the bald scalp out as well. Okay, this is a schematic of how to design it. And it's way oversimplified. So clearly I don't make recipient sites as large. But these are potentially what's called diphylicinar grafts, which is in the right candidate. If there's grafts that are uh, locked together, that they're very close together, you can, you can actually keep two follicular units together so you can pack them in more tightly. I build that backwards, and then from that, I build the hairline going forward. So you want to think of it like a coastline. A coastline is very, it, it just breaks apart and you get this very natural, irregular, irregular pattern and you finish it with creating sentinel hairs, which are these one hair grafts that float in front of the hairline. And this is just a, uh, a result that you can see the little sentinel hairs, you can see the natural, irregular, irregular pattern. It's not so jagged and it's not so straight. And it's that slight difference that makes the difference between an artistic result and one that looks fake. And this is to show you the idea that not only are the recipient sites angulation important, but transitions. Do you notice that there's very smooth transitions? Because if you look at a scalp, there are never abrupt angle changes. There are slowly graduated changes on the top of the scalp, and you need to replicate that when you create sites. This is just showing you what you saw earlier, which is just the sites made with uh, micro punches. And this is just another example of that. And this is um, something, again, a complex, more advanced topic. I, I encourage you not to start with crowns because they're harder. And you see that how they blend right to the posterior mid-scalp. There are really very little abrupt transitions. They all bleed into the surrounding architecture of the scalp very, very smoothly. And so that's important. Females are even more complicated. You can see these sites actually create a cow lick and they whirl backwards. That is something I definitely wouldn't start out with when you're building uh, hair patterns. So to finish up with a few results here, um, white hairs are really difficult to dissect, but the great thing is they provide really great density in a single session. And female hair, this is two sessions with a little bit of hair coloring. You really can take care of this frontal temporal loss and rebuild a very natural result for them. Asians, the trick here is it's, it's difficult because their, their hairs are so, um, so, so round, thick, and, and uh, straight that they can look very unnatural. So you really want to create a much lower uh, angulation. To end with a few um, complications, you can see this is, it almost looks like pubic hair. And the reason is that this is due to manipulation from the part of the staff. If the staff 
holds the shaft during insertion, they actually create so much trauma that can maybe not grow out well or grow out in a kinky fashion. So you want to be careful of that. And that's the one difference is if you're a great rhinoplasty surgeon and you have bad staff, you probably will still deliver good results. But in the world of hair, if you've got bad staff, you get bad results. You need a full team. This is almost like a F1 crew, you know, F1 racing crew. This here is another example of a bad result corrected. Two, uh, all these have two straight hairlines, by the way, and bad temple transitions, you can see this. But you can see the pitting and compression. So these graphs are too large for the recipient site, and they're placed too deep to the scalp. So in other words, the epidermis of the graph was placed below the surrounding uh, area. So that's why it grew out poorly, and this is one of my corrections here. This is, you see what I told you, don't make the graphs too high angled up. And that's a great example. It looks like a picket fence. And these graphs are also too large, and also the transitions are poor. And that's just a correction there. I end with this. I just purchased this device. Um, I don't have financial affiliation except the fact that I got it. And that's a big financial affiliation. Um, and uh, this is, uh, the, I think, the future for certain subsegments of the population. Not for everyone. It's follicular unit extraction, or FUE. The reason it's not for everyone is if you, you have to shave your head for this, and most men don't want that, but also some men that don't want uh, to wear their hair short or just are deathly afraid of an incision no matter what you tell them, this is a really good device. And what it does is it allows you to extract the grafts from a perfect angulation that I think the human hand can't replicate to this level. Uh, and it's, it's the same people that the principals that did the Da Vinci system for the GU and GYN systems, uh, and it's just it's an amazing robot. Uh, this is my book I wrote with uh, my colleague and, and partner in my, in my practice who works on the assistant side. This is for assistants, this is for physicians. And I really encourage you, if you guys can make it, I know it's a big pitch to come to St. Louis. It's a great course. Um, I'm very, very passionate about teaching and I, I hope you guys can make it in mid-November. Thank you for your attention.